one thing that we have to share is that both of these couples have actually gone through real life issues from finances to fertility. And when you put that in context, when we did some research, we found that, so um, in a university, I think University of Michigan, they actually had 100 couples Right, and they said that they should record the arguments that they have. And the three top areas with arguments were communication, children, and money. <laughs> so that being said, um, let's start this with the word of God. Um, if you please share with us Psalm 133 verses one to three. Because really, after the fight, it's really about managing conflict and from godly wisdom and from the word of God, amen? All right, so behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. Verse three, as the dew of Hermon that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. So that being said, we're gonna go, we're gonna go um, from right to left. Just a little housekeeping, we ask that each of our panelists spends two minutes each answering each of our questions. We have some special questions for some particular people, <laughs> but for the most part, we'd like to hear everybody's opinion. So the first question is, what non-negotiables, ma'am, we'd like to start with you, please. What non-negotiables and boundaries have you put in your marriage to navigate conflicts? Um, in uh, conflicts, we, we made up our minds that whatever happens, we must settle. I want to say that by the grace of God, we, I have never kept malice. Yes, there are conflicts. Yes, there are fights. Shouting matches. <laughs> but we never go to bed without talking to each other. Those are the boundaries. No matter what, we greet each other in the mornings. We must greet each other and we must call each other when we are apart. Even though <laughs> there are issues on ground. So those are the boundaries that we have put in place to help us reconcile. Thank you so much, ma'am. So the first note to take, don't keep malice. Amen? Amen. Amen. Pastor Kolasa. Yeah, um, no matter how you know, angry, I must eat at home, unless I'm fasting. Uh -huh, you know, I mean, uh, and she cooks very well, trust me. So, you know, so, so that's there. We never go to sleep without, um, you know, resolving, so to speak, any conflict. Because uh, I, I get alarmed when I hear people say irreconcilable differences. Because I don't see any difference that cannot be reconciled. So we have that at the back of our minds. And then, you know, yes, it may take a bit of time. You know, maybe let each other cool off. But, you know, it's usually dealt with. And we move on from there. Thank you very much, yeah. sir. All right. So, sir, I'd like to hear from you. I, I'm not sure. We have like agreed, non-negotiable, like, you know. But I know that we don't, I know we don't discuss our matter with others. Yeah, so, I mean, after, as our seniors were answering, I was like, running through my mind, like, okay, this is non-negotiable. I'll not be like, yo, we break down. Yeah, this is non-negotiable, yo, we break down. Chige. <laughs> And I mean, for instance, when they say they don't go to bed without settling, we have gone to bed without settling plenty of times, <laughs> right? So I'm just keeping it real, yeah? Um, say uh, there's another one, then we're like, okay, no, don't. If, even though we can't like say, okay, we're never gonna do this again, maybe we'll do it again, right? But I know that when it comes to whatever conflicts we have or whatever issues we have, we never discuss it with, like we have a couple that from even before we got married, that has been like our, our I'll say model marriage. They're not popular like that, but exemplary Christians. So the moments when we need counsel that we, you know when you get to like the end of yourself, and you feel like, okay, I need, we need counsel beyond what we have, then we boss them, we report ourselves to them, we go with them, and then they offer us counsel. So, I mean, I mentioned that to say that's the only 
that we are discussing, those are the only people. And it's even rare, maybe, maybe two years, you know, most of our conflicts eventually between ourselves will we deal with it and we settle. Thank you so much, Takashi. First off, I just want to say thank you so much for having me here. Such an honor. And I mean, I said it's really, you know, when they were saying their own, I'm like, we, maybe we have plenty of things to learn. <laughs> but you know, for us, really, it's not we. We don't have any recipe. We don't have any agreed that we must not do this. We must not do this. You know. But one thing that I have seen over time, as you know, we have conflicts and we settle, is that we always have conversations after. You know, when we are when we both calm down and we are all, you know, nobody is vexing or shouting. We usually kind of have conversations about okay. You shouldn't have said this, you shouldn't have done this, you shouldn't, and then, you know, that just helps. So that next time when something similar happens, we're able to, you know, navigate better. Yeah, so. Thank you so much. If we're taking notes, communication, no external parties, until it reaches the point that you have reached the end of yourself, and it's at home. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. And so, you know, we had mentioned divorce being rampant. And, you know, so we've come, so I just want to know now, just, you know, your experiences. Have you ever reached a point when you were like, because last time we had a panel, a couple of panelists said that they reached the point in my mind, like, you know what, I'm, I'm done with this. I don't want to do this anymore. Did you ever reach that point and how did you navigate it? Yes, please. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I can't remember any. There, there's really none because it's not an option. Yes, it's not an option. I mean, maybe our, our what do you call it, our own generation. Mm. So it's not an option. We never talk. Okay, it's like when we entered it, we entered it for life. So when the conflict, we don't. It's not. Okay, let's reconsider or what is that? or we say uh, put the bible aside there's no putting the bible aside mm. we don't have that at all there's no putting uh, 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 okay some say that uh, leave uh, leave jesus aside or leave the bible aside uh, let's talk this now uh -uh. it's nothing like that so we, we've never really considered it even when we were waiting for children god was not going to give us then that so be it no change of partners. Praise the Lord. Amen. Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you so much, Ma'am Chai. Pastor Kala, I want to ask it from a different perspective. So we know you're a coach and a counselor. What are the times that you've seen young people, like young people like us, you know several of us, what are the behaviors that you believe that, because one thing that we have learned is, and even listening to you all this morning, Obviously, people need to work on their resilience and the fruits of the spirit. Mm -hmm. What are the attitudes that you believe that our generation have now that we really need to check? Which will actually help us, you know, go into the marriage with that mindset of this thing is till death, the worst part. Okay, number one, um, this is a generation that is in a hurry. I call it a microwave generation. Everything sharp, sharp. Now, 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 now. You know. I realized that, I mean, I used to be a very impatient person, still work in progress. Uh -huh, my daughter is looking at me now. Uh -huh. Right. But you see, God used that to slow me down. You see, marriage is, like she said, it's for the long haul. Probably because God had already prepared me even before I went into it. So I knew that, yes, I was going to be living life with somebody from a completely different cultural background, you know, character background. I mean, she's a gentle person. I am a bit gentle. <laughs> right? But you see, you know, I, I realize that for this generation, if we will just not be so much of in a hurry, if we process things through, because some, sometimes, you know, the little things that, <laughs> God, a couple came to me once. They had made up their mind this was the end of the marriage. In fact, thank God for an older sister who said, go and see Pastor Kola. I mean, you know, you can't end it like that. There were already children in this marriage. You won't believe it that the source of this problem was, I don't like the way she makes my soup. Something has... 
you know, for some of us, it's trivial, but it meant so much to this fellow. It meant so much, you know. So, what am I trying to say? In all of all this, my advice for this generation, Gen Z, right? Uh -huh. Please, let us just learn patience, resilience. That was the word you used. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. You know, um, the research that we had talked about, just as Pastor Kola said, fights about bad habits made up 16.2% of total arguments from husbands compared to 17.1% of wives. So that's actually one of the top five issues that people have bad habits. And apparently, too, the way you cook soup. <laughs> so we'd like to hear from both of you. So did you ever reach that point where you were like, this is wild. This is a wild ride. What are we even doing here, Seth? No, so, so if, I mean, the question is, if you ever go to a point where you're like, I, I'm not doing it again, or like that kind of thing, I, no. There was, there was never that point. Um, I, I, I feel like we're in my experience, Sha, so, <laughs> so far, that at times, a woman can say, what she doesn't mean in the heat of a moment because she's very passionate and there's a pain point at that point there's a pain point in that moment that it's almost like I, I feel like it's a dream between men and women maybe right where if if, if you have like an issue, I, I, or, I've spoken with many people, even my mentor, the person, the husband in the, because I, in the, men, the uh, mentor couple, right? There was, I, I think the, the, the baddest conflicts we've ever had was that one we now had to go and meet them. But before we went to meet them, he called me one particular night. And we spoke for maybe like 30, 40 minutes. And from what, the reason why I remember that conversation is because what I'm saying now, he, he alluded to it. So he was, and I remember when he was saying it in my mind, I'm like, ah, yo, I thought it was me, <laughs> right? So he was like, you must be able to like, in grace, isolate that maybe comment from it, it's not a even though it sounds like the, your wife is describing the entirety of your marriage it's not she's not describing the entirety of your marriage it's that moment in time that is such a pain point that she's speaking about but speaking as if it's the entirety of marriage so you as the man must be able to step out of that emotion isolate that comment and then help her process the situation. Literally, it's, it's, it's almost like dying. <laughs> Which is like what the Bible says that you, you love your wife like Christ loved the church and gave himself. So, I, I, me, I say that when people argue submission for women, it's because we don't understand what the Bible asks men to do. If you understand what the Bible asks men to do, you never want to be a man if you're a woman. We don't Amen. get it. If you get it and you realize the sacrifice it requires to love your wife the way the Bible says you should love, you know, submission will just be flowing <laughs> like water, right? So I'm, I'm saying divorce is never like, it, ne it, it is not, it's not an option. I did not come into marriage with an option. Jigged. However, I think on the flip side, because I know that there's nothing carrying me from here, I'm here. It may also reduce how much like effort I'm putting into getting things to be better. You know, she does she does that more. You know, for me, I'm like. Maybe I'm able to, if we're like at 60%, I'm like, 
so, well, for, all right. But she's like pushing the buttons to be like, no, this is what I want. I want us higher, I want us better, and, and all of that. And so I have to continually be upping my game. She mm. But do I, have I ever gotten to the point where I say I'm done with this? No, I'm never, and I'll never. Praise God. Mm-hmm. Hallelujah. So, ma'am, I have a specific question for you. No, n- nothing is more amazing than when you see the spirit of God flowing. What he said about, you know, the way you speak, I actually wrote down this question, and I wanted to hear from both you and Ms. Pastor Serena. And so it was like, the question is really, when do you tell yourself you are wrong? What pointers do you provide for yourself to bring yourself back when you're vying off? You know, and I'm asking this specifically from the context of a lot of women now, they're financially, you know, stable, they're educated. We literally have access to the same opportunities you have. Last night, I was listening to, you know, Dorito's, and it talked about how, she talked about when she gets home, she's not that person anymore. So how do you identify, okay, I have a problem? Not necessarily a problem, but I just, you know, Okay, so I'll give you very, uh, 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 an example that literally happened, I think, in the early months of our marriage, right? So we had gotten married, and I think somewhere along the line, within the first six, eight months of our marriage, you know, somehow we just, those were the moments we had a lot of conflicts, because I'm very strong-willed. My husband is very strong-willed. He's from Ikiti. I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry to all those that are from, but, you know, we always had... I must do my own way, you must do your own way. So we had those clashes a lot in the beginning, in the literal, you know, first few months of our marriage. And then I remember it was also in those times that, you know, I was always used to say something about how he didn't like coming home some, most of the time because it just felt like there was a dark cloud in the house because I'm always, we must do this, we must do that, we must do this. And so one particular day, I honestly can't even remember what the issue was, but we're really arguing and having shouting. No, in fact, I was the one shouting. It was just quiet, looking at me. So I'm like, so you're not going to say, you're not going to talk anything, you're not going to say anything. And I was just going on and on and on. And then he turned and left. Me, you know, I was newly married. This was my first year. You know, we are going to be 10, so don't judge me. But... <laughs> I did. I pulled the man of God back and said, no, 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 no. We are going to finish this. We must settle this matter here and then. And uh, he just looked at me. And he now left him. And I went into the room. I was still in the living room. I was there boiling. And then I now went into, later I went into the room. I didn't see him in the room. I checked our bathroom. I saw him on the bathroom on the floor, right? So there was water running on it. And I was just crying. I was like, what did I even say now that you're crying? Blah, 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 blah. Anyway, Later, please don't judge me, don't judge me. <laughs> don't judge her, don't judge later, her. Later, you know, later, I think maybe maybe later that night or the day after, you know, when I when I'd calm down, right? When I having a conversation and then he said to me that, you know, he felt like he made the wrong choice marrying me. Wow. Ha! You know, that kind of did like a reset to my brain. <laughs> like this is me. I mean, I'm such a good girl. I'm, you know, I'm a good thing. Like, why would you come and feel like you made a mistake marrying me? You know, but what that did to me was, yes, it said to reset my my mind. But it took literally took me to God, and I remember just really carrying myself to God and say, Well, God, see, the way that this thing is going, if you don't give me wisdom for this marriage, I'll finish destroying it. Like, how can this person say that he feels like he made the wrong choice marrying? And we are not even one year married. <laughs> So how would the journey be like, you know? So it was from then that, you know, literally, just literally, you know, taking that scripture that says anyone who lacks wisdom, let him ask. I literally was asking God for wisdom. And I remember that one of the first wisdom that God gave me was the, I used to say, the spirit of shut up. Like I had to learn how not to always be saying what is, like if I want to say something, the spirit of shut up will literally come upon me and I'll, I'll just keep my cool and just shut up and not say what I want to say in the heat of that moment, you know, so, and that has really helped me. So, you know, looking through the past 10 years now, literally, we literally have very less conflicts, very, very less conflicts, but it has, be, it, it has been because... I've we both have more sense now. <laughs> But I've just really come to understand that Funto is saying, in the heat of the moment, you don't have to say what, what, you, what is on your mind to say, or what is right at the tip of your lips to say. Just let that moment pass. And then when, we are, when all the tempers are down and everybody is calm, we can now have a conversation. So that has really helped. 
Thank you so much. We are so blessed that every time we have panelists, they are so transparent and authentic, and they always share their stories. So as Mrs. Zibioye was sharing, the scripture that came to mind is a wise woman built her home. Yeah. And you went to the word. And also, when Guy's Baba spoke, I quickly opened scripture. You know there's something that the Bible says about dwelling um, according to knowledge. Mm -hmm. With um, yeah, giving honor unto the woman as unto the weaker vessel. And that's what he did. So it's such a blessing and a gift. When you hear these scriptures, you read these scriptures, then when you see it, you know, playing out in real life, it's not just gist, it's not just a story. Thank God. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. So Pastor Serena, ma'am, I really want to hear from you as well. You know, there are a lot of younger women. You have two daughters. All of us, we're all your daughters by first. <laughs> And so, you know, we would like to know, when we look at ourselves, how do we know that, look, at this point, you are wrong? You need to go back, go and realign, find out what the heck is going on. Like, uh, when we got married, I mean, like he said, he is the, the one that is fast. And so he easily gets angry and shouts, but I'm the quiet one. Then he said, <laughs> he said, he said, he raises his voice. <laughs> See, he's stopping you. looking at you. So, but I'm the one that is slow. And what I make up in the slow action is my mind. Very quick with my mind. So, I used to take him up by surprise. In my shout, I will keep quiet. Sometimes I smile. And he hates it when he's shouting and I'm smiling. It's not as if I'm not getting what he's saying. <laughs> but I just, initially, I used to cry. I would go into the bathroom. I would not let him see my tears. I would weep. Then I would turn to God. Sometimes just, I would just, this is my prayer. I used to pray that a lot. Lord, help me. Mm -hmm. Lord, help me. And I would clean my tears and come out. But I made up my mind. That if it, in fact, at some point, sometimes oh, I, I end up saying sorry for what he should say sorry for peace sake. And then later, I will tell him that I gave him the name Broski. I say, Broski, you know you were the one that was supposed to apologize to me. And you're doing it as if I'm the offender. You say, eh, okay, sorry now. I say, no, say it properly. <laughs> then you will not say I want them how to prostrate to say it. <laughs> True. Because you wanted to say properly, so I say, I'm sorry. True. But there, there was a time when, you know, because of financial pressures, the lack of children, and so on. So, you know, it's like an external force that is pressing you together. So, and. I understand that he's going through it. I'm going through it too. But, you know, he will express his, his, his own by, you know, unleashing that mm. anger on you. Uh, or if you just slightly overdo the pepper. You know I don't eat pepper. Are you good? <laughs> so I'll say, okay, you know what? Should I change the food? What will you like to eat? If I can make another one. I don't want. I say, Kola, but I made this food for you. And later, maybe out of, you know, the law, if, if you're a child of God, yeah, you have the spirit of God, yes, let me talk man. to you. And then he will come back and say, where is the food? Let me just take some. I say, no, don't take it. If you don't want, I will. You know, but with time, we grew out of it. Then at that particular time, I, 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 I used to do something, it might be bad, I used to shut him out. Mm -hmm. I would greet him, we would talk, and I went away, he would call me 20 times. But I will make sure that I am very polite, no gist. I mean, but we are talking. No, I will make sure that I'm very, you know, polite and so on. I take care of his needs. I do the needful, but he's out. When he sits, I leave. Yes, and that got to him because I tried to talk to him. I tried to communicate to him that, come, this thing, let's talk about it. You know, but he was, you know, you know how men don't like, they don't have the patience to sit down and talk. So what I did was I just drew the curtain. And he know that he knows that that is not me. So I just shut him out. He realized it. If he's talking, I, I will answer him. I will pay attention to him, but I'm not going to play with him, you know. I'm not going to say, ah, you did you know, have you heard? 
Have you seen? Oh, I bought this for you. Huh? Uh, until he now found himself and now said, okay, see, I know I have offended you. Now let's talk. Then we now started from there. So since that time, if I try to call his attention and he's not giving me attention, I just look at him. When he's talking, the way I look at him as if I'm watching TV. <laughs> and, and he knows. But with time, when our children came, and you know they're girls, mm. so they grew up fast. So there are times, they now became like our, <laughs> they're part of the family, of course. We report to them, he reports me to them, and they, they, they talk to us, and you know children don't know how to hide themselves. Mm. They will tell you, and then sometimes when I'm reporting him, they will say, mommy, you know what? You are like papa, it's just that you take two different routes to get to where you are, you are the same thing. I say, eh, okay. Then I know how to apologize to him when it comes to that. I say, Broski, no. sorry for what I did. And he might not give me face that time, but eventually he knows I'm sincere. I will talk to him and say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And then I will make sure that the food that he has been asking for long, that <laughs> I have refused to make, that food will first surface. Yes, I will go out of my way to, you no matter what, make the food and then push the food first, then sit down and say, Broski, I'm very sorry for what I said or what I did. And God has really helped us. And lastly, I want to add this scripture. I think it's then Ephesians 4, verse 2. So that has really, really helped us in the area of home. We say, I think it's verse 2, always be humble and gentle, be patient with each other making allowance for each other's fault because of your love. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you so much, ma'am. Ephesians 4, verse 2. Hmm. Amazing. So, again, Pastor Kola, we're coming back to you now as a counselor. Yeah. And, you know, for mommy, we've learned a lot about the right way to apologize, walking in the fruits of the Spirit, and, you know, the proverb that says, a soft answer breaks a bone. Mm. So if we now go deeper, what's the, what's the difference? Because one thing that we see and we hear a lot is people trying to manipulate and be controlling even in the midst of conflict. So really, what's, where do you draw the line between you as an individual walking in the fruit of the spirit and playing the fool, and when you can identify that, look, this your partner is just being selfish. Okay. And this is again, as we said, because we know that you have counseled a lot of young people. Okay. You see, I'll just quickly say here um, where a lot of people miss it is you, you know, they said something very, very, very instructive. We should learn to isolate the person from the issue. You see, I realize, at least from my counseling experiences, um, for example, the example she gave now, I mean, I don't like pepper, not because I hate pepper, but because I used to be an ulcer patient, so I had to go pepper. So I had now become used to not taking pepper. Now, that the food is peppery, it's not because she hates me, so it's not the opportunity to begin to pour with two perishions on her. No. You know, the Bible says in Galatians 5, you know, I learned that one even before I got married, and that is what helped me. You know, it says, if you bite and devour one another. Continue. Okay, Galatians 5, uh, 15. That if you keep, you know, if you keep biting and devouring one another, it says be careful that you don't destroy yourselves. Uh -huh, thank you. They put it on the, on the, you don't consume, you know, one another. It's very, very key. So we, we, we must learn to isolate the person or to differentiate the person from the issue. I mean, for most men, you know, their sense of self-worth is when they have money in the pocket. You know, because, oh, now they are not able to meet needs, they are not able to do this, they are not able to do that. And then at that time, you know, I say, okay, uh, you know, rice is finished. Uh, hey, you understand? You hear that and it's like, ah, okay, so she wants to rub it in that I don't have money. But of course, she doesn't, you, I mean, you understand. So but if you are not able to isolate the person from the issue, then it becomes easier to deal with. I don't know whether I, you know, thank you. Praise God. Thank you so much, sir. 
don't know who else was like they're in marriage university here, amen. <laughs> <laughs> amen. So sir, I have this one question for you. It's a burning question. <laughs> you know, we've we've heard your story and we've we heard that when you guys just got married, and this is a financial question, I'm sure you guys have answered this question several times, but we need to hear it here. So when you guys got married, you are making more money than him. If I'm right, up to five times his salary. And you still went into the marriage. That's, you should not say, I still, it's not she, you should say, and you still went into the marriage. You should be more difficult It's she, you should say, and you still went into the marriage. I know, we need to hear, in, really? This is their experience. I want to hear from you. Oh, praise God. <laughs> so, so, for me, it's really about a male perspective. Now, personal experience. I, I was with someone and he said, look, I don't want to ever know how much you're making. Very clear, because as far as he was concerned, once he found out, it would change his perspective of me. And truly, I didn't take it, it can't be that serious. And I shared, and truly, his perspective shifted. Real life. But you're a man, you are well aware of this information. Yes. You know. You do not know what he was earning till you started dating. I now, like. No, you don't know. It might be word of knowledge oh for someone. <laughs> like, so, you should always have full disclosure before getting into... At the into... time of the disclosure, it was a disclosure that caused things to shift. All right, all right, all right. Yes. All right. <laughs> that being said, but there are other things, but that being said, you know, you found out and you still wanted to go forward. Why? And what was, what, what was, what was the position of your mind? Like, I really want to understand, what's your perspective? What made you so confident, so bold? Because in the reality, like, if you think about it today, and I'm just being honest, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, we meet a lot of couples, and I'm not saying that, um, you know, apart, not at, we've learned that we don't say apart from faith. The reality is five times more is not 50% more. If she, her income is five times yours, and you're supposed to be the breadwinner in quotes, what was your mind, you know, what, where was your heart going in to this relationship confidently? We really want to learn this because there are a lot of young single men, you know, in our congregation and listening online as well. And it would be great for them to learn from your perspective. There's, there's so much I can share. <laughs> Like I'm just yeah, there are different points inside when you're talking, I could say I can go from that side. As you're talking, I can go from this side. Now, at the time that we I mean, I told her what I was getting monthly before we started dating. But when it, it was clear that it looks like this thing is, it has the potential to go there, right? At that time, I'll share the state of my mind at that point, but then I'll share something else I came to learn from another one of my mentors. There are majorly two, really. One is marriage. One is my, my journey my essence, my music, all of that. So it was this, uh, the other one that I learned it from like two years or three, about two years into our marriage. So I'll share that one. It's deeper than, I think at the time, so when you say, what gave me, why was I able to like go, you know, um, I don't think I was defined by what I was earning. I also don't think I defined her. I also don't think I defined her by what she was earning. It's important. It's possible for you not to define yourself, but you might define the other person based on income. I didn't define her based on the income either. I, I, maybe I've always been crazy. I don't <laughs> I don't know, but I've just, I've, I've never really been like the regular like guy. Now, also, so when I say, so she was earning 150K, I was earning 30K. Yeah. <laughs> In 2014. So let me, let me, 2012, we got married 2014. In 2012, but it was still the same thing by, by 2014. No, no, no. 2014, it was now zero. <laughs> yeah, 2014, when we got married, it was zero. But I need to give you the right context. I was already gays. 
I was a musician. I was on a deal. So it's not like I was working somewhere and they were paying me 30K. I was musician, making music. The, then I was on a deal that the, the supply of funds was to the music, not to me. So myself and the person that signed me came into an agreement that let's not go the way most labels go. It will get you a house, get you a car, but all those things are busy. You will still pay back. So let's not pump money into you as a person. Let's just focus whatever money we have on the music. But you need to keep body and soul together. So we we'll just put, a, we'll put together an allowance that at least you can live on. Right now, that allowance was 30 grand. The third, and we used to record everything we record everything we spent, record everything we earned. And the deal was as we are spending money and earning money, when what we earn breaks even what we are spending, then we now start to share what we earn 60 40 or 50 50. So, technically, that wasn't what I was earning. It's just I was in an investing phase of my career. And the hope was the music will now start to pay. And then what I earn will now become 40 or 50% of what the music is bringing in. So she understood that setting. But at the, that point in time, that was what I was getting in nominal cash. Now, about three years into my deal, I remember that we hadn't broken even. And Irewesi had entered. You know what irrelevancy? I don't know how to put it in English. Weary, discouragement, right? And I remember my mom calling me and saying, I, because my mom understood my deal. So my mom said, this allowance you are collecting, stop it. This, you, can't, you can't break through with this allowance, one. And this allowance is making you not drive hard on the music because at least something is coming. Stop the allowance. Don't get anything. You will not die, I promise you. When you're not getting anything, your head will wake up. You think about what to do on the music. So that was when I got on the zero part. And we're now getting, this was now months before we got married, right? So, but that was the, that was my own. So when you ask me, why was I able to like go into it? It was like that. But I wanted to share what I learned from my mentor because you mentioned breadwinner. And this might shake your theology. But, there is nowhere in the Bible where the man is called the breadwinner. Nowhere. The scripture that we have used over time to refer to men as breadwinners is where Paul was talking to Timothy, I think, and he says, any man, some translations say anyone that cannot provide for his own, not say his family, his own or his own household is worse than an infidel. Number one, he wasn't talking about marriage, he wasn't talking to couples, he was talking about widows. He was speaking to the issue of widows and he was trying to explain the kind of widows that qualify for help from the church. He was speaking and saying, the widows that you should help are the widows that don't have any family member that can take care of them. Because if you have a widow in your family, you should take care of the widow and not put the responsibility on the church. Because anyone that cannot take care of his own is worse than an infidel, as, de as, as denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So, he's talking to men and women. Anybody in the family, once you have people working and earning, and you have a widow, you should take care of the widow. The Bible says, the man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two of them shall become, no, one flesh. One is unity. One flesh is one entity. One is that two of you are united. No, one flesh is two of you have actually become a single entity. You are not two separate people. You are a single entity. So when God looks from heaven, he's seen one entity. 
He supplies that one entity, regardless of from which side the supply is coming. The problem is when you define your essence as a man based on what you are earning and what you are able to give your wife. You should earn and supply for your home. You should have that responsibility. But your essence should not be defined by that. There is more that I bring to my home and the leadership of my home and the guidance of my family than the nominal cash that comes in. Yeah. You are priest, you are provider, you are protector. You are a lover, a the prophet. You see all those things. The only one that is money is provider. If that's all you are doing in the home, then you're like one over five. You're not priest. They want to pray over the children. You, you can't pray. It's the woman that is praying. You can't protect. You can't rise in the middle of the night and speak over your children while they are sleeping and say no harm is going to come to this home. You can't do all of that. All you are doing is earning money. Any fool can make money. Hallelujah. Very quickly, I, I remember, you know, when I got married, uh, she was a full, I mean, she was working from youth call. She got a job, was working. At that time, I was an um, independent consultant. Uh, another word for unemployed. You know? Um, you know, so he was getting 30. I mean, mine was zero, you know. In fact, I, when the Bible says the just shall live by faith, that was the just. You know, that's how I had marriage. And my scripture then was, he who finds a wife finds what is good, obtains favor. So, Father, you must show me favor. And, you know, it worked. It worked, you know, because even early then, I mean, the first year of our marriage, I can't remember us taking money to say we're going to the market to buy things. Somebody came in from Benue. Oh, I went to Benue. Uh, I got this yam for you. Oh, I went to the house and so bag of, I mean, so any time you came to our home, I mean, you must eat now. In fact, we will force it down your throat. But you see, I did not just leave it there. Brother, man, that, that's some rema, you know. You, you see, unfortunately, our Christianity is practiced within a cultural context. And in the ambience of that cultural context, that is where they say the man must provide. Hmm? You understand? I mean, the times when things were not, I mean, several times she has, you know, paid school fees, paid rent, done all of all that. But, you know, I had to rise up to the occasion. So I want to encourage you, brothers. Don't say because, uh, you know, Pastor Kola and my dear brother here, I mean, the married without jobs. <laughs> Why look for work? Uh, remember, I have said it, that this generation, unfortunately, you are in a hurry. Uh, you are in a hurry. I mean, the grace that works with her, or that worked with her, it's not very, very common these days. Mm. Uh, they want to know, what are you bringing on the table? I mean, what's your paycheck? Mm. And then one thing that helped me, yes, yes, yes. I mean, I, I, let me quickly mention that now. In all the accounts I have, except the one I opened recently, I mean, she's a signature to all of them. So, I mean, I'm not hiding anything. When there is money, she knows. When there's no money, she knows. So, I mean, that's the transparency we are talking about. It's got to be there. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Let me, you know, yield the mic. Anybody else? Yeah. Anybody else here just experienced a fantastic mind shift? Yes? Hallelujah. So, um, we just want to thank our panelists for answering our questions thus far. I have one more question, but we have five minutes. And, you know, some people in the congregation have questions for you all, yes. And so I just want to honor the people that have sent these three questions. Thank you so much. I think we can take at least one more question. So um, I'm going to quickly ask, yes, we'll be, okay, we'll rush, right? Yes. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> and I please have to correct. I was saying guys about his gaze, Baba. I apologize. Yes. Okay, so let's start from the first question that came. Um, is sex a good conflict resolution tool, i.e. make up sex? That's such a good question. Um, no, I, I, <laughs> actually, I would like Pastor Serena. Mommy, will you please answer this question for us? Is sex a good conflict resolution tool, i.e. make up sex? 
Well, for me, after the sex, or if the conflict is not well resolved, yeah. then we yeah. continue yeah. from it. So it's yeah. not. It's not. And um, like I heard a pastor say, before you were married, you, all your mind was dwelling on sex. And now that you are married, you are married they are begging you to have yeah. sex. So it's not. So uh, what, what we actually do when it comes to that, we talk about it openly and try to, you know, because the truth is that a lot of people, they are not saying it. Sex is actually one part of the problem that couples are having these days. One, because um, as you grow older, probably if you have like uh, some afflictions like high blood pressure, <coughs> um, diabetes, or your challenge, you know, health-wise, it might reduce the desire to have sex. And if the person, one, one of the spouses that has that is ashamed to discuss it, and the other one will feel deprived. So those are things that people should actually watch out for and talk about it openly and seek medical counsel. Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, wow. So essentially, sex is, that the answer to your question is no. So, ma. I'm so sorry. <laughs> sex is not a conflict. What's the conflict? I want to use conflict that word. Conflict resolution tool. Tool. Good. Sex is not a conflict resolution tool. Sex is greater when conflict has been resolved. So sex is not the conflict resolution cake. See it like that. It's the icing. After the resolution has been done, if you don't resolve it, that sex gone will not be sweet. You have to resolve the resolution first. If you succeed at resolving the resolution, the sex on another level. Another level. So it's a conflict resolution reward. <laughs> Glory. <laughs> okay, so the next question, and I would like to hear from you, please, Mr. Bui. Is, is there a place of... Is there a place for emotional intelligence in conflict resolution? Oh, yes, absolutely. There's a place for emotional intelligence in every aspect of life, how much more in marriage, because you need to first understand this person. I mean, it has taken me really almost 10 years of our marriage to come to understand my husband to a certain level. I mean, the way I understand him now is not how I understood him before. And because I understand him this way, it has reduced the level of conflict we experience in our marriage. So I know, I know when my husband, I know, I know the face he makes when he's about to be angry. I know, so I know that, okay, don't talk about this, don't say this, don't, you, so I've come to that understanding. It has really taken emotional intelligence to be able to decode that. So there are certain issues I don't bring before him when he comes looking in a certain way or when he's, you know, when he's walking, when his head is in his walking, or there are just, just certain things I don't say. You know, so it takes emotional intelligence. And when you get, you know, when you really understand that, it really reduces the, the conflicts that you have in your marriage, yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. So the last question, and um, I don't know who answered this, but let me share. Does a wise woman, sorry, if there's any, if there's any other question? No? Okay, that's fine. Does a wise woman build her home mean a woman must be the peacemaker at all times? Hmm. Question. <laughs> Pastor Kola's mic is already ready to go. <laughs> no, you see, um, you know, when they say a wise woman builds the home, that doesn't necessarily mean she must be the peacemaker at, at, at all times. You see, uh, generally a woman is looked at like, like the homemaker. Hmm? The homemaker. I mean, um, when it comes to children's issues, everything. Eh? I mean, she's there, you know, to make sure things work. You know, they said something very, very instructive at the beginning. No third parties. I mean, it's a foolish woman who will go out and say, oh, that's my useless husband, da -da, da -da, and so on and so forth. A wise woman wouldn't know that. Rather than tear down, the wise woman tries to build with her words, with her actions. Not that she must necessarily be the peacemaker. Uh, after the Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers. Uh, so, they will do what? Uh, so, any man who wants to uh, 
Uh -huh. If you were endeavor to be a peacemaker as well too. But I mean, a woman being a, a, a home builder doesn't necessarily mean that she could build the house. No, no, no. Much more than that. I mean, she just ensures that there's a smooth running of everything in the home. I mean, God has created them. Please, give a round of applause for every woman in the house. <laughs> Mo you know, so multifaceted. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't want, I wonder how they do it. They still have the same, you know, 24 hours like we do, but they're able to put in so much, even within so short a time. Huh? Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me just share. When I was getting married, some months before I got married, my, the person who signed me to that deal, I told you about, it's one of the most proud people in my life, taught me a lot of stuff. But when I was getting married, it was in, most of what he taught me is in life, business, music, business, all of that. But when he knew we were getting married, a few months to go, he called me. And he said, Giz, let me tell you, if your marriage fails, it's your fault. I, 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 I can never forget that statement. He said, I want you to have that. That's the mindset you should have as the man. He said, if the marriage fails, it is your fault. It is not both of you's fault. It is your fault. He said, the success of a marriage is heavily dependent on the head of the marriage. If you have that mindset, as, and, and I run with it, that's part of why I have that default. That, well, there's no way we're going. This marriage cannot fit. It will work. Do you get? So I don't, I don't even see the success of the marriage as shared responsibility. I know that that's how we should, that's not, in my own psyche, I see it as if this marriage fails, it's my fault. And I, I might not be able to prove this, but that scripture says a wise woman builds her, builds her home. It doesn't say her marriage. It says her home. So it's the entire home. That's the balance of the home. Father, mother, child. She's like the thermostat mm -hmm. of the home. Thermometers measure temperature. Thermostat sets temperature. So the woman kind of sets the temperature of the home. But you see that marriage, it is you, the man. If you have that mindset, first of all, it will guide you who you pick. So you go, people not go give you too much problem. <laughs> she understand. So yeah, have that mindset as a man that this marriage is not going to fail because I will not allow it to fail. Hallelujah. Praise God. I think that's a beautiful place for us to end. And it's amazing that he mentioned that the man is the head. I know that the scripture we started with in Psalm 133. The unity is like the anointing oil from the, on the head of Aaron. Praise oh. God. We just want to celebrate and appreciate our panelists. Thank you, so Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for honoring our invitation. We appreciate all four of you. God bless you all. Thank you for coming. Thank you, church, for listening and participating. God bless you all. Thank you. Amen. I think I take a picture. Sorry.